determining when the children died was such a sticking point in the case because if we couldn't prove that the children had died before July 23rd, then Kevin Neal could not be held responsible for their deaths. If they died after he got locked up, then he's not the murderer. The defense asked renowned forensic anthropologist Dr. William Bass to re-examine the evidence. Dr. Bass ran the body farm, which is the epicenter of studying things such as body decomposition, smell. It didn't seem like there's a better expert to get. When you're dealing with cases, you go back to the people who saw the evidence at the time that it was found, and then you deal with the autopsy report, and then the crime scene photos. The position of the bodies gave Dr. Bass his first clue. I was mowing hay, and um, first trip around the field, I noticed uh, the odor of something dead. According to Andrew Stickley's statement, he first noticed the smell when he was standing nearly 10 meters from the bodies. The odor was fairly strong. Uh, I wouldn't say overpowering, but it was very noticeable. If a person had been dead two months and <clears throat> they hadn't been smelled before, I would be surprised at that. Dr. Bass explains there is a typical smell pattern immediately after death. In the fresh stage, you get very little smell. There would be some smell, particularly if you were up close to the body. But normally, you don't get much smell. The pungency increases with time. The second, third day, you'd begin to smell. The third to the uh, tenth day, you'd be smelling quite a bit. After two weeks, the odor would reach its peak and then subside. Therefore, according to Dr. Bass's theory, the bodies would barely smell after two months. Certainly by three weeks, the, the smell is gone or is decreasing. This theory determined Bass's final conclusion. I thought that these individuals had been dead somewhere between three to four weeks before they were found. This would mean the children had died in August, after Neil had been sent to prison. Dr. Bass's conclusions were critical to our case, most, I think, importantly because of the timeline that he presented. The bodies had to have been placed in the field during which time Kevin Neal was incarcerated. Witness accounts seem to support Bass's assessment. The township workers mow this cemetery once or twice a week, uh, they would have mowed within 20 feet of the bodies, and it just really puzzles me that they weren't discovered sooner. These children were found near a well-kept cemetery. This was not an abandoned, weed-cluttered, forgotten cemetery. It was an active cemetery. It had caretakers. Its lawn was regularly mowed. Why did no one, they who mow the lawn, those that visit the grave sites, why weren't they smelled? The defense was certain this evidence proved Kevin Neal's innocence. Kevin was incarcerated, therefore could not be responsible for the death. But they still had to challenge the most incriminating evidence, the insects found in the remains. The whole case rose and fell on the question of the time of death. Once Dr. Haskell was able to put the time of death at between July 9th and July 14th, we were able to use that as further corroboration that those children died on July 9th when they were in Kevin Neal's care. The defense decided to seek the expertise of another entomologist. We can go to a doctor to get a second opinion on some major surgical procedure. You can bring in two scientific entomologists. They can look at the same evidence and reach different conclusions. The defense asked forensic entomologist Dr. Robert Hall to review the evidence. I got a uh, telephone call from the Ohio Public Defender's Office, and they had some questions about some forensic entomology evidence and asked if I'd be willing to give an opinion. Dr. Hall began a painstaking review of the prosecution's findings. One of the first questions that one has in a forensic entomology uh, investigation is whether or not the, the specimens at issue have been identified correctly. Hall questioned one of Dr. Haskell's insect identifications. The black soldier fly uh, uh, was found in the mature third stage larva. Identifying it as a mature third stage larvae was a significant distinction. 
That means that they're grown up uh, about as big as they're going to get, meaning they're as old as they would be expected to be before they pupated. But Hall disputed this. The length that I measured uh, was between uh, 8 and 12 uh, millimeters. A mature larva, uh, one that is about ready to pupate, would be somewhere between 25 and 32 millimeters long, which is a significant difference. They were only about 40% the length of a, a mature third instar larva. So my conclusion was that they were third instar larvae, but they were not mature third instar larvae. The length of time it takes the black soldier fly to develop into the mature larvae stage could have serious implications for the date of the murder. So there's about a month's difference between the, the two ways of looking at, uh, at the size of these particular uh, larvae. This meant the children's death would have occurred up to a month later than the prosecution's assessment. You could say uh, maybe, maybe a month. You could say maybe six weeks. Uh, both of those would be reasonable estimates. Paul was concerned about Haskell's limited time interval for the murders. My final conclusions were a fairly tight range interval of uh, July 9th to July 14th for death to have occurred. In my opinion, the evidence does not substantiate a post-mortem period that would be as precise as the 9th to the 14th of July. There's just too much biological variability to allow that uh, sort of inference to be made. Paul argued there were certain variables such as weather and location. The trouble you've got is that that's a guess. It's not science. Paul arrived at a different time period for the murders. A reasonable guesstimate based on the entomological evidence in this case is that the individuals could have uh, been dead as late as the 1st of August. The defense were confident that Hall's evidence had shaken the foundation of the prosecution's case. These children could not have died by the laws of science until a week or two after Kevin was in prison, proven by the science of bugs, the science of the smell. Myers believed an innocent man had been charged. The real killer was out there. The defense had more evidence. Items of Cody's clothing were found after Kevin Neal had been imprisoned. A couple weeks after Kevin Neal is long since locked up on another charge, they find the boy's shoe sitting on top of that trash pile just maybe 50 yards behind the house. Cody was wearing the shoes on the day he disappeared. The presence of the shoe was unexplainable. The shoes were found in an area which had been repeatedly searched since the children went missing. They searched that pile. They had the dog search that pile. There was nothing there to be found. The shoe wasn't found in the initial searches of the area because the shoe wasn't there. The defense contended the real perpetrator had placed the shoes in the rubbish pile after the searches were over and Neil had been incarcerated. He's in prison. He can't also be out planting shoes on, on piles of trash. He can't do it. The shoe was something that really was advantageous to the argument that Kevin was innocent. 